I do want to take a moment to thank you guys all for praying for my dad. Um, he did come home yesterday, and um, he's doing a lot better. He's got a long um, road of recovery in front of him, but I'm thankful um, to have a church family that backs you. And, you know, we may not see the whole picture of what God's doing, but I know that his hand was in, you know, everything that took place. And um, the song that I'm singing, actually, he laid on my heart a couple weeks ago, and I thought it was pretty fitting. So, <clears throat> I may not have riches like some others may, but I have a mother who knows how to pray. And there may be some things I've missed in my youth, but I have a father who stands for the truth. I have a goodly heritage. I'm blessed with things you can see. I have a goodly heritage, and that is worth far more. the future my parents pass on to dwell in that city we've come to call home they may not leave me the wealth of this world but i will their God and His Word. I have a goodly heritage. I'm blessed with things you can't see. I have a goodly heritage and that Tell you what, that is so true. A godly heritage is worth more than anything. And I mean that. It's, I praise God that my parents got saved when they were younger to be able to lead me and my, my siblings to the Lord and didn't always pan out the way I guess they would want um, for a little while. You know, kind of went to the world for a little bit, but praise God, I'm back. Amen. And there's a lot of things that God has done in our lives, and I thank God so much for for being able to pass that down, amen? Now my children get to ha have a heritage handed down to them, amen? And hopefully that continues through. Praise God for that. All right, I'm gonna jump right in. Um, Luke chapter 17, Luke chapter 17. So glad that you are here with us today and those that, are, that watch online as well. Thank you for um, being attentive. Um, I just wanna give you a little heads up. This message today is a two-part message. I'm gonna be doing another one tonight, the second part to this, and I encourage you to please watch it. Um, it kind of really flows together and you need to watch tonight to really kind of get a good gist of what we're doing this morning as well. So if you can't make it back, get a chance to watch it online if you would. See, that's... Um, I kind of like, you know, I'm kind of torn a little bit with the online, having services online, because I want people to be in church. I and mean, that's, that's a big one. But if you can't be, you get to, be, get to see it online, get to get some preaching stuff, some word of God online. But then it also is encouraging because there's no excuse. Amen. You can watch it any time, 2 o'clock in the morning if you wanted to. Amen. So you can always get, get some preaching. Um, Luke 17, and I want to look at verse number 28. It says, likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, 
they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you again, Lord, just for Lord, your grace, your mercy, your love, your kindness. Lord, just thank you even for your judgment, Lord, that we can learn and grow. And I do pray that you help all of us today to really take some time, set everything else aside, and just take some time and listen to what you have for us. And please help me as your servant to be able to preach with your words and, Lord, the direction and instruction from the Word of God. And I just thank you, Father, for your love. But please meet with us here this morning. We need you and we love you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of you know the scripture, have heard something like this. It says, likewise as it was in the days of Lot. Now, you go through and you read the context of the scripture and stuff. Um, it's important to, that you see a lot of things, talking about the, spirit, the kingdom come, you know, the kingdom um, as Christ is going to talk about what's to come and different things when he's coming back, what's going to lead up to a lot of that and, this, and the second coming as well. Um, but we look at this and it says, likewise as in the days of Lot. Now, he uses Lot specifically and that's why you got to take note and most of us know that during the days of Lot was not a good spiritual time would we agree um, during the times of Lot God used that as um, a time in scripture he, he talks about that a number of other times in scriptures as well that that was a spiritual dark place and that's why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah now during this days of Lot, the Bible talks about they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built. That means they went about life. They just kind of didn't think of really much. They just went day-to-day -day life. And then it says, and as, that, as Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Now, all of us probably know what that's like in small, small ways. I mean, certainly we've never seen anything like that. Hopefully we never do in our lifetime. But what's happened is all of us have gone through our day just getting up and starting our day just like we normally would any other time. But then something changed it in a dramatic way. Correct? And we've all dealt with something like that. You're going about your day and all of a sudden maybe you're on your way to work and you have an accident. You never thought about it, didn't think about it, but bam, you have an accident, mess up your vehicle or something, or you get a phone call with bad news or just things happen sometimes in an instant just in our ordinary daily lives. Right? Now, we live in a time in our history now that things aren't spiritually good. Um, certainly they can be so much better in our times. Um, we're living in a, in a time that is very similar to times of, of Lot. We know we're in the last days, and I don't want to belabor that too much. If you look through the scriptures, especially reading through Timothy, it gives a good list of what's happening in the last days, and <laughs> we're there. So with that point, um, as in the days of Lot, the same as today. Now, there's a lot of talk in this world. Um, we're seeing a lot of changes here in America as well, and I'm certainly not getting into politics and things, but there's a lot of changes in our world. We're seeing more in our country. There's things that happen around the world that's been happening for many years, some even generations, that have seen tragedies and heartbreak and different policies that have hurt their people and different things that's happened in history. And we're seeing changes in our world as well that are going against teachings of the Word of God. And because of that, when the further anybody gets away from God, the more judgment that is allowed to come, and at the same time, it gets harder. It gets certainly harder for those that are involved in that. Now, there are rules to live, live by. We're all in agreement with that, right? Everybody in here has rules that you live by. Um, some are different than others. Some rules that you may have are different than the person might even be sitting next to you. And that's not bad. Um, some things really aren't that big of a deal. Some things don't really change a dynamic in a person's life. Other things do. Some things are more serious than others. There's certainly no doubt about that. Um, but we, it seems like we're living in a time where everyone wants to be accepted for whatever they choose. And they expect other people to 
come in line with what they believe, you know? Now, let me also state this, that's not unusual either. Because if you think you're right about something, you would think that everybody else should agree with you, correct? I'm like that, if I think I'm right about something, <laughs> that means you're wrong, right? If, I, if you're opposite of what I believe, I mean, one of us has got to be right. But that's not always true, of course. Some of, sometimes you can be kind of mutually right on things. But it seems like we're in a, we're in a time when, in our, uh, at least in our country, and I'm seeing more around the world, that there's getting, starting to be pretty strong divisions on what people believe and what people think, right? I mean, or at least that idea has been elevated quite a bit over the last number of years. But um, the problem comes is when we start forcing certain beliefs on other people that don't believe that. Now, when you have something like that, you can kind of see both sides, right? I mean, if, if I am right, let's just assume this for a moment, which I usually am, but if I'm right, if I'm right and I believe I'm right, and I think it's the best belief to have, not only for myself and everybody else, well, I'd like to be able to enforce that on everybody, right? If it's best, what I believe is best for me and for everybody else, if I could force it on everybody, everybody would be best, right? But nobody likes that idea. Well, I shouldn't say that. Common sense says that's not really a good idea in itself because God didn't even do that. God knows what's best, right? But he didn't force that on everybody. He says, this is what is best. You choose whether you want to do what's best or not. Isn't that true? It's called free will. So, although would it be good if God forced what's good on everybody? Yeah, it would be good. Everybody would have to be good. But you would lose free will. You would lose choice. And God's all about choice in the word of God. Good or bad, but it's about choice. With that thought, if you are right, if you think you have the right to tell others what they need to be or how they need to be, don't th doesn't that mean that others have the right whether or not to listen to you or stand or believe with you? It goes both sides. But what happens is we get a problem in our own selves when we think that what I believe is superior to everybody else's belief and therefore I'm going to enforce what I believe on everybody else. It's good if it's really good. If everything that you're doing, if somebody is in power like we have, you know, dictatorships and stuff around the world, they say this is what I think needs to be done and so then they force their country to adhere to what they believe, whether it's a few people or one person or whatever, they enforce that on the people and then the people have to adhere to that, or there are what? Consequences. So if you disobey, let's say, a king or a dictator, you don't do what they say, there's going to be some kind of consequences, usually not good ones, because they have the power, you don't have the power. Correct? For the most part. But I want to do something here this morning that I think is important. Look at Isaiah chapter 5 with me. Isaiah chapter 5, because... We're living in our, at least in our country, we're starting to see things, some things that other places in the world have seen for quite a long time. And what that is, is people thinking they can just do and be whatever they choose they want to be, and therefore they can do whatever they want to do, despite what people think. And when you get that kind of mindset, there becomes a lot of opposition. So look at Isaiah chapter 5 and look at verse number 18. Let's look at some times in the word of God that talk about times like we're seeing today. Look in verse number 18. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as it were with a cart rope that say let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it with an exclamation point. Verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. 
Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. I want you to hear the passion. You see a lot of exclamation points in, this, in these scriptures. And it says, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink. And it goes down through. Isaiah is one of the, certainly a major prophet known for the time of Israel and Judah being in the time of judgment and captivity. And there's a lot of warnings in the book of Isaiah. There's a lot of um, prophecy of what's to come with Christ. He certainly gives the most on the redemption um, of Christ. But we see here he's given a lot of warning and he's talking about sin. And he's talking about people that call evil good and good evil. And I tell you what, I, I see it more and more I think you can't deny we're living in a world where in our society, even in our country, where people are calling evil good and good evil. I mean, it's, it's clear. It's there. I don't care how you, you'd have to be ignorant not to believe that. And so with that truth, what's happening is we're living in a time when things are opposite than what they should be. And when God says something and he places a truth, it's our responsibility to uphold that truth and to stand on truth, no matter what happens in life. See, I'm one of those people, and I know if you know me, um, if you've been in a church a while and you know me, that I'm very passionate about what I believe. And I, I hold pretty strong on a lot of things. I think it's important to have integrity, um, to have character. And I get, I like action. I've always been a person of action. I like making things happen. And that's just, I don't know if it's something that has bought, brought up in me, if it's innate, I don't know. But I, I struggle with finding that balance as a Christian, as a person, as an American. Just, I struggle on where my place is and what can I do to make things right with things that I don't think are right or going in the wrong direction. And so what happens is, it's certainly over the last 10 years and certainly elevated over the last probably five or six years, there's been a oh, frustration in me about acting. What can I say? Where do you take stands? We're living in this world, so I'm, I'm living in this world, but I know I'm not of this world, so I need to know Where's my place on issues, whether it's governmental issues, social issues, um, community things that happen, and most importantly, spiritual issues and the cause of Christ. And so I've struggled trying to find where my place is. Has anybody felt like that, or is it just me tonight, this morning? All right, a number. Doing that... When you struggle with, with that, you have your own ideas. You have your own beliefs. And so when you have those beliefs and you believe action needs to be made, you got to figure out where's your place. What do you do in the whole? Now, Isaiah is talking here. He says, listen, woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity. So people that are just bringing in Iniquity. Iniquity is sin of the heart. Um, and then he goes down to say sin, as it were, a cart rope. Just, just piling up sins in their life. They don't care. It's just kind of bringing it in. They're taking things that are good and calling it evil. They're taking evil things and calling it good. And they're very bold about it, as, as the scripture is talking about here. They put darkness for light and light for darkness, who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. So they believe what they believe. They're standing strong on it. They think they're wise. They're smart. They got it. And he says, but boy, there's sin coming like crazy. You know, we got to be careful as Christians not to get caught up in the worldly mindset of this world. Worldly means the opposite. What I mean this morning is the opposite of the godly mindset we are supposed to be living by. It's easy to get caught up in events, problems of this life because we live in it. We see it. We're affected by it. Openly affected by it. And so what happens is we need to have an influence on this world as Christians. i totally against the Amish thought of where you take your own little people and you go into your own little environment and you live the best, holiest life that you're supposed to live. That's what 
overall. I know there's a lot more to that, but overall. We are Christians, and we are here, and we are supposed to be affecting this world for the positive, for God, right? We're not separating, we're not hiding ourselves. We should not be hiding ourselves in church, in our homes, in our own little communities, and just trying to stay with us. We are supposed to be reaching this world. But we're living in a world that, wow, sin is just growing and growing. We're going to see more of that here in a moment. Um, people are embracing things that are opposite to the word of God. Just complete opposite. God says, like, homosexuality is wrong. Bible states it, it's clear. Fornication is wrong. Bible states it, it's clear. Sex before marriage is wrong. It's scriptural. But people don't like hearing this stuff. You know, they don't like hearing that... Um, it's okay to be atheist or worship another god. No, it's not. It's not according to the word of God. There is only one God. But people don't like hearing that. It's offensive today. And so what happens is we're getting a mentality and it's become very normalized and even celebrated to believe that all these things are okay. And if you oppose that in any way, there could be very major consequences for that. And it's clear, we're living in that time. So you have the word of God and you have morality, you have truth, and you have the opposite where people are saying that evil is good. So if you don't like that, I'm wise, you got to listen to me. And so where do Christians stand? Where do we stand and how do we affect this world? And that's one of the things I've struggled with is where do you do that because part of Affecting this world is, the big part is reaching people, reaching souls. And a brother that's, that's offended is harder to be one than a great city. So it's like I don't want to go out and offend people, but at the same time I need to certainly reach them, but I need to hold on the truth. Do you see what we're saying? Now there's ways of doing that. It's, it's, I think a lot of it comes behind the heart. I think the heart means everything. I think if you have the right heart, which is a godly heart, People can start seeing through things, and I, I had, I guess, some experience in some of that with people, but I started thinking where, where our society is today, the condition of our world, and how we as Christians have to live in this world and be affected by it. I want you to look at verse number 23 of the same chapter we're reading. It says, which justify the wicked for reward... And take away the righteousness of the righteous, righteous from him. So in this time that, that certainly we're seeing Isaiah is talking about during this time of their captivity being affected. They were completely engulfed by the things of the world of, a, of an ungodly society at the time. He's giving these woes. He's giving these warnings to the children of Israel. And, and inside those warnings he says these people they're justifying the wicked for reward. So they're justifying. That's, that's a key. They're saying, hey, it's okay. That's okay what they're doing. I may not agree with that, but it's okay. To each his own kind of mentality. But then they're also, at the same time, they're taking away the righteousness of the righteous. They're taking away the things that a, a righteous person is supposed to be standing on, the truths, the principles, the godliness, of the, of the scriptures, the, the walk with God, and taking things away from them. They're losing rights in that area. I want you to think a little bit about your life and what we're dealing with as Christians. This Sunday morning, you're in church for a reason. You have a choice to be here and you don't. So where is your belief in the Lord? Where is righteousness? Where is truth? Do we justify, as the scripture says, the wicked? For reward or not, a reward would mean you gain something from that. But if you justify a wicked person, you're getting some gain from that. Like if you have to stand up for something, are you willing to lose for what you believe in truth? Or would you go along with it so that you keep something or you gain something? We're living in a society where that's becoming more and more real. Certainly, Many examples, I know people that have gone through events like this, lost jobs and stuff because of standing for certain things or pulling away from things that used to be very clear to them. And we're going to look at a few things here this morning. But, you know, I, I was reading a lot 
and there's been a lot of talk about um, a lot of things in our society about morality, the, um, how should I say, the, uh, how far a person goes and when we take stands. It's like the whole thing with, um, all right, let's use this one, the school boards with Virginia and that, that whole thing. And a bunch of parents getting upset because they don't like curriculum or something that is being taught to their kids in public schools. And so now there's a bunch of people that got all upset about it. They said, we're going to elect you out. Okay, we're not getting into politics on that reason, but I want to understand something. Parents have a right to their children and to teach them what they need to do. It's a fact. And if they have that right, what's being taught to them? Well, their choices. Either they can pull them out of those schools and teach them at home or put them into another privately funded school or something like that. Certainly a great option as well. Or they can try and change the schools that their kids are going to. They can stand up and say, this is what I think is right and this is what I think is wrong. Correct? And that's what they're starting to say. There, there's a group of people in Virginia that are saying, we don't like what is being taught here. But there's a problem because not everybody has the ability to be able to pull their kids out and financially put them into a private school. Not everybody can homeschool their kids and, and choose to do that. There's a lot of people that are just trying to make it by single moms, single dads, different things that like don't have as much that op option. But everybody has an option to stand up for something that they believe. It doesn't always come out the way they want it either. There may not be changes. So where's the balance? Where does a person take that stand? How far do you take that? Well, a lot of it has to do with the individuals that are affected. Because there's always two people. There's people on opposite sides. This person believes one thing, this person believes another. How do we get how that affects the majority? That's usually what happens. That's what's supposed to happen, at least in a, in a Republican society, that if we're in a republic, you got to make choices. The kind of the people that have made the most get the most. You know, you have 20 people for it, five people against it, 20 people are probably going to win out on it. So I ask you a question as a Christian. Where do we stand on what we believe? What actions do you take? Where's your limitations? Where's your lines? And then where do you begin? And how do you change? How do you cause change or lead to change? That's important. Actually, that's pretty critical. There's a lot of um, opinions people have. But there is a lot of leading from the Word of God and how we handle many different kinds of um, issues that come up in our life. Um, I am not, and I'll be very straightforward with this, I am not for violence. I don't, I don't think that is our role as Christians to enforce what we believe on violence. I think it's wrong. I think it's opposite of what the scripture te teaches. I'm not saying there's times when I'd like to get out there and shake some heads, but that's wrong, and I don't think you should, and I won't be doing something like that. But I do believe we should have passion to make a difference. And I believe if you can get enough people that believe the same things, change does come. For a positive side and a negative side. For godly and the ungodly. You get enough people of ungodly to make changes, you're going to see changes. Just life. But you can get enough righteousness on the one side, can overcome evil. If my people, the whole scripture, right? I want you to think a little bit here this morning about some things that we need to do. Because in the, in the case, we're starting to see our society, the worldly society, starting to change the minds of the society. Um, there's a whole thing I've been te reading about, uh, it's called Panorama Cell. It's um, being taught in public schools today. Um, 1,500 school districts and over 13 million students are using this Panorama Cell. And that stands for Social Emotional Learning. And so what happens is, they are believing that they have the right as the school board, and um, it's, it's literally the National School Board Association, backed up by the... Um, um, Department of Justice, Attorney General Mark Garland, 
and other um, things within the government, they're saying, as a school system, we're not only going to teach the basics and the things of education, we're, we think we now need to educate morally and socially children, which becomes very dangerous if it's ungodly thinking and ungodly things being taught to your children. It's very good if it's godly things and, and God-honoring things teaching your children, right? Um, you'd like it if it was solid and good, but you don't like it if it's not. Now, if you go through and you start thinking, who has a right to do that? Well, that's kind of up to you. Who do you relieve the right to do those kind of teachings? Do you want a school system or another teacher to teach your children moral truths? It's up to you. You could say, yes, I do. I have no problem with the school system teaching my children moral truths of today. I trust them. Okay, that's your choice. It's up to you. But if you don't agree with that, well, then what do you do? The biggest thing is being aware of what's being taught in anything. I don't care. It's, it's important to know what's being taught in your, in your church and in your Sunday school classes. It's important to know as a parent what's going on with your children's education. Amen? So with this, I want you to think a little bit today, this morning, about where do I go and what do I do with what I believe? Where do you become vocal? Where do you put action into being? And do you really have a, a conviction about it? I think one of the biggest problems with Christianity over the last few decades as, is Christians have pretty much stood on their own instead of putting action in where we need to. Instead of saying, you know what, I think we need to change these things that I believe are biblically wrong or against the Lord, we've kind of stepped back and said, I'll do my changes, but I'll do it in my home. And we lose the influence of changing a world. And so we got to be careful with that. I want to give you a few things here that I hopefully will understand. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And look at verse number 10 with me. It says, and then shall many be what? Are we all there? Matthew 24, verse 10. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall what? Hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So now we're starting to see where there's People getting offended. There's people that are betraying one another, turning against each other, and they're hating one another. I'm telling you what, I've seen more hate in my lifetime, and certainly there's been a lot worse before me, but I'm seeing it so clear, people just having solid hatred towards other people. I've seen it in Christianity, where Christians are having this hatred and passion against the unsaved. And we're seeing a division happening where people are attacking and betraying each other, as the scripture says. And then it says, because iniquity is abounding, because sin is abounding, just like we read in Isaiah in their time, saying because sin, inic sin and iniquity of the heart, the sin of the heart is just abounding, getting more and more, people are not loving each other. The love of many is waxing cold. That is a shame for Christians. Shame. So therefore... We as Christians need to learn through this and say, okay, well, where's my place? How can I be effective in change? And how can I be, do my part in trying to influence an ungodly society towards our God, a living God, and not offend and not get to a place of my passion leads to hate? How do we make that balance in life? How can I have that burden and that passion to do right and to do my best to influence the right without hurting people in the process? Can we see where that feels like a little conundrum? Where that can be hard? But I believe there's an answer. 
Look at what it says. As he says in Zechariah chapter 8, look at verse number 16. It says, these are the things that ye shall do. Speak every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. And love no false oath. For all these things that I hate, saith the Lord. For all these things are things that I hate, saith the Lord. So God is saying here in Zechariah in, in, in prophecy, he says, speak every man truth to his neighbor. That means you don't hold back truth. We have a right as Christians to proclaim truth. Say, no, that is wrong. That evil that you're calling good is evil. It's wrong. That good that you're causing, that calling evil, it's not. And we have a right to stand up and say, no, this is truth. This is real. Amen? But too long, too many Christians have been holding back on those things. Because we're, it's hard sometimes for people to find the balance because we're trying to reach the lost, but how do you tell them they're wrong and not offend? You can't do that a lot. But you can with God's influence. And we're going to look at that hopefully in a little bit. But verse 17 says, Let none of, your, none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. You know, I have talked to people and Christian stuff that were just, the way they've talked about the world, people that disagree with them, was, has been very hurtful. It's like, well, how, why do you have that kind of hate towards somebody when that's who they are? If somebody's worldly and they're lost, well, hello, they're lost, they're worldly, they're a child of the devil, as the Bible says. So what do you expect? Our job is to love them, to teach them the truth and bring them over to what's real. Amen? And that's just real. And so as we go through this, there's some things. Look at Proverbs 14, verse 9. I'll just read for it real quick. Proverbs 14, 9 says, Fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. He says, hey, there's fools that make a mock at sin. If it's sin, they mock it. Oh, that's no big deal. Oh, who cares about that? Oh, you're you know, over-exaggerating. Oh, that's not a big deal. Why would you think that's wrong? They make a mock of it. But among the righteous, there is favor. See, if you're doing something right for the Lord, God can cause even your enemies to be at peace with you. If you're doing right before God and you're doing your best to try and follow the truth and, and influence the truth in our world, we can find favor. I believe that comes from spiritual, not from me, not from you. See, there needs to be Christians that aren't afraid to just tell the truth. Stand up for what's right. It may cost you something. We're going to look at more of that tonight. But I want us to understand something. The condition of this world is literally bathed in sin. But is that new to anybody? Are we, is that a surprise? That we think that we're living in a sinful world? If it is, you're missing the whole boat. Because this world is bathed in sin. It's what it is. 1 John chapter 2, look at what it says in verse number 15. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 it says, love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You know, those are just simple truths. As Christians, as God's children, he says, don't love the world. Don't even love the things that are in the world. We, this world is not our home. But yet we get very comfortable in it. Right? And I understand God wants us to live that he made this creation for his, for his glory. We, he, it's, it's important for us to not throw away the goodness of God. I enjoy what God has given us. But if I have to lose it all for integrity for character, for truth, then you lose it all. What shall a prophet of man shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The problem is so many people today don't like losing what they have because they're too attached to it. It's easy to say that if you have nothing. It's a little more difficult when you have something. But you know, I, I want to talk 
I think it's important for Christians to start making some changes. And that begins with me and our church. I really believe we're at a point in history we can really make a major difference in this world. But all of, it's not really in the ways you're hearing about all over the place. On TV and the talk shows and the th things, immediate, the different things. The influence of this world is driving Christians to make poor choices on how to reach this world and how to be effective. Social media is, wow. I've been on it for this last year and some things, and it's scary, shocking even, what I hear from people that I thought, wow, you should know better than that. But you know, we're seeing some changes in our world, and I want to look at a few things real quick this morning. Look at Isaiah chapter 3 with me. This is important before we wrap this up, and I encourage you, please come back tonight or listen to it tonight, but Isaiah chapter 3 in verse number 1, it says this. For behold the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. Now when he's saying the stay and staff, it's, he's talking about the two necessities of life, the two chief life supports like bread and water. It's, it's the foundations, basically, when he's talking about taking away the stay and the staff. He says, I'm going to take away the whole stay of water, the whole stay of bread, and the whole, and, and the whole water, the stay of water. He says in verse 2, the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet, and the prudent and the ancient, the captain of 50 and the honorable man, and the counselor, and the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator. And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. What we just read, I want you to remember. Take heed, contemplate, think about this, meditate upon this. Because in verse 1 he says, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away. God is taking away these things from Jerusalem, from Judah, from the children of Israel, his children. He's taking away all these things, the necessities of life, all the good things, the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the prudent, the ancient, the captain of the fifties, the honorable man, the counselor, the cunning artificer, the eloquent orator. He's taking all these good things away from his children because of their actions and their inactions for their beliefs and where their heart was. He's taking these things away. You know why? Because they don't deserve them. Every parent knows what's that like. When your child is being miserable and disobedient and you can't know, you take things away from them. I've had to do that with my children. You want to talk like that? You want to act like that? You're not having something that you like. He doesn't deserve that. She doesn't deserve that because of their behavior. You know, Christians, we're seeing a lot of things leave our country. Our country started off as a Christian nation with principle. <laughs> Believe me, not everything, but principle. But we're seeing things taken all the time. You know whose fault that is? Yours? Mine? It's not the world. The world was already there. It's us. It's because what we're doing and what we are allowing, what we are accepting, and what we're not doing anything for. That's why. But yet we have to be sidetracked on these other issues because it's not my fault, it's theirs. That's the problem. We don't want to admit we're wrong. We don't want to think I'm the problem. We want to blame somebody else. We want to blame this other person, this other group of people. We want to blame this incident instead of saying, it's me. And then stop the pity potter and say, yeah, I know it's me. <laughs> what am I going to do? Do something right. Stop the little pity party. Stop the throwing the fit. Stop crying about it. Stop the ignorance of it and say, you know what? Let's do something about it. Amen?
but what do we do? I'll be very honest with you, I've struggled with that. More so because being a pastor, because of my influence and my responsibility as a pastor of how do I affect without hurting or losing. But you can't always judge it on that. But yes, I have to, but you know what? I'm pretty confident now what God would have for us. I really do. Look at verse number 8, and we'll finish this thought, though. Verse number 8, it says, For Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen, because, this is why, their tongue and their doings are what? Against the Lord, to provoke the eyes of his glory. You know why these guys are fallen? Because what they're talking about and what they're doing are against God. So our concern should be, how am I, the way I'm speaking, and the way I'm behaving, how am I affecting my God? That should be our biggest concern. And you know, when he talks about those people in Judah and Jerusalem, he's talking about people that are part of the nation. So that means you and I that are part of the nation. We got to be concerned about what we're saying and what we're doing. That means before you jump on your little social website and start saying a comment because of something you read or something that you thought was unjust or wrong, you got to be careful what you're saying because is it lined up with God or is it just what you think at that time? What you're standing for, what you're believing in, does it line up with the word of God or does it just kind of go with your passions at the time? Because we're not of this world. We shouldn't be. We're supposed to influence this world. We're supposed to do our best to make the right changes in the world that we're living in. But we got to do it the right way. With the right heart. How do we do that? To be continued. Tonight we're going to talk a lot about that. The condition of our world is terrible. The condition of our country is terrible. The condition of our city is terrible. The condition of our homes in general are terrible. We're fallen. I don't want to talk about, well, the Bible says the end times. The Bible says this is going to wax worse. I get that. But there's always been a remnant in history that has made changes. Let's start here. But we do have a responsibility. There are ways to do it right. And God does give a good blueprint for it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your word. And I thank you that we can look to you for truth. And Lord, we live in a fallen world. We live in a very sinful world. And Lord, that's not new. We know that's just a fact. But Lord, you are good. You are righteous. You are holy. And help us, Lord, to be just like you. And I do help, pray, and ask, Lord, that you please work in our hearts as your children. That we'll take heed to this truth and that we will make a difference. And stop struggling with inactivity and knowing what to do and what to say. But find the truth. And I do pray that you help us, Lord, here this morning to acknowledge our place. To acknowledge where we are at. Lord, we have gone through some tough times, Lord. And Father, there could be a lot worse coming. We read about things in your word that's going to be coming in the end times that, Lord, frankly, none of us want to be a part of. But, Lord, you can help us, Lord, make a difference to see more people saved and more people getting closer to you and see light in a dark place. Father, I do pray that you please help us, Lord, this morning to really make a difference in our own hearts so that we can make a difference in this world. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let's take a few minutes and talk to the Lord. And I truly do want you to stop and think. And let's not get distracted by these things of this world that, frankly, shouldn't be our concern. There are things in this world that need to be our concern, that really should be a part of what Christians do.
in our society and policy and government, just in general around the world. But there are many things that really should be for somebody else to fight because we have a far more greater responsibility to hold true. We're going to look at some of those things this evening. The condition of our world is dire. But we can make a difference for the better. If you're in here this morning, I do want to encourage you to stop and say, well, what can I do? How can I make a difference? But ask yourself first, are you willing? Because truthfully, it's going to take some suffering. It's going to take, it's going to take a loss of some things. And we'll talk about that, but you got to start with, am I willing? Let's make a difference. This world needs more light. This world needs the Lord Jesus Christ. The world needs to know the truth of the word of God. It's been hidden or blinded or just pushed away from so many people for so often that it's time to make some changes. Christian, let's talk to the Lord this morning. If you finish praying, let's stand together and thank you, Pastor, for that message on the condition of our world. It's so, so true. It's as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything we're seeing is stuff that's been building up throughout history, and it's amazing the condition that our world is in today. But we still have hope no matter what, that we have our Savior that's coming back. And as we go throughout this week, let's share that hope with other people so that they can, they can hope as well and to, so they can share it and have that effect on our world. Don't forget, come back tonight to hear the rest of that message. And we also have church on Wednesday and game night this Friday. So come back and let's worship together in everything that we do. And let's pray. Heavenly Father. Thank you for this day, and thank you for your many blessings you've given to us, Lord. Thank you for that message that you laid on Pastor's heart, Lord, and help us to be strong in your word and be able to give an answer for the hope that's within us, Lord, and be with us as we head out today and keep us safe as we travel and bring us back safely tonight, Lord, and in your name we pray, amen. Thank you, you're dismissed.